A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. We are recording this on March 3rd, 2021. I am your host, Anna Garcia, and we have two very exciting guests today. It's the gals from True Crime and Cocktails, Lauren Ash and Christy Oxborough. Hi, ladies. Hi, how are you? Hi. Hi. Good. I'm so glad you're here. But, you know, part of your thing is that you two dress alike. I'm so disappointed you didn't dress (laughs) matchy-matchy today. You know, that is a misstep on our part. We're just trying to be our best professional selves. I think this is like business, Christy and Lauren. And so, you know what? What I'm hearing is we need to invest in matching business suits. Oh, we could we could pull those off. I just yeah. felt like I was trying my best to be like a full grown up, yeah, mm-hmm. which is very difficult for me. Mm-hmm. So uh, I was like, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna come in professionally. So I didn't even think to ask Lauren what she was wearing. Missed up. Oh yes. my god, I do have to ask you this one question about when you do wear the matching outfits. So, like, do you each buy it from the same retailer, or does one of you buy it and then send it to the other? How do you do that? Well, it all kind of started uh, when we would visit each other. So Christy lives in Canada and I I live in Los Angeles. And so, you know, would I show up and she'd have new matching pajamas for the two of us? Sometimes, yes. And so uh, that's just kind of, you know, snowballed. And then when we started doing the podcast, anytime we got kind of like a new merch, a new T-shirt design, we would just have them sent to each other's houses type thing. And there you go. Boom. We keep the tradition alive. There's a lot of pictures of us as little kids because we're, we're very close in age. So we got dressed alike as little kids. So we're really just embracing our, our honest roots. Oh, so cute. And you two are related. We yeah. are. Yeah. You almost hesitated like you didn't want to admit that. <laughs> well, it, this is the thing. We're, we're cousins by blood, but we're sisters by life. So yeah. I would refer to her as my sister. But technically, for the fact checkers, uh, we are legally <laughs> cousins. Yes, because we have attorneys monitoring this. Yes, which we're very grateful for. Very grateful yeah. and respectful of. Oh, my God. This is so funny. And now, Lauren, you're also on NBC's Superstore, which is, isn't that shot here in, in Burbank? It is, yeah. Universal Studios, yeah. Because when I drive on Barham Boulevard, there's this facade that you can see. And I'm like, at first I thought, oh, is that a new store? But it's not. It's yours. I know. And it's so funny because it's, it's flat. Like you can't go, people think that we've built a whole store there, but it is just a facade. It's just the front. And then the actual interior of the store is on sound stages that are on the other side of the lot. But it is quite a, it's quite a spectacle. It's, it looks very impressive and very realistic. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to get into our cases, but just so for folks who don't know you, you, you do this podcast, you tackle crime cases, you drink, um, are either of you, do you have backgrounds in crime or are you criminals? I don't <laughs> No, <laughs> no, no, no either of that. I will promise, uh, to the lawyers listening. We are not criminals in any way. No, <laughs> I'm just, uh, I'm just a stay at home mom who it turns out really, really loves to research. And, uh, Lauren is just like triple threat over there can do everything. Actress, hilarious, funny, gorgeous, all of this, incredibly smart. Um, And we just both really like unsolved mysteries and that kind of spiraled into other true crime cases. Yeah. And it's really, our our show is really kind of a product of, it's it's a nice silver lining of quarantine because, you know, I don't think we would have necessarily even thought to do something together had we not been in this cool, you know, Zoom world that we're in now. And we discovered that we both had this like obsession uh, with the new Unsolved Mysteries on Netflix. And Christy was like, you know, maybe I'll just do a little light research. She's reading books. She's teaching herself how to read forensics reports, autopsy reports. Like she is so good at it. She's being very humble. It has been (laughs) such a cool experience, not only kind of stumbling into doing this thing together, but also uh, really seeing Christy like learn that she has this like affinity and skill um, for for research. It's been it's been like a really fun 
uh, really cool thing to discover ourselves in the middle of. And yeah, we drink while we do it. So it's fun. It's a fun hangout too. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I'm really excited, Christy. I want to be, uh, I, I know you're going to wow us with some background on some of these stories. So let's just get right to it before everyone on YouTube starts with their complaints. Oh my God, get right to it. Get right, <laughs> you know, do you get that on your show where there's yep. someone who posts the exact <laughs> time when the cases begin and the chit yep. chat ends? Yep. Right. <laughs> Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> and, and, but to that, I say, like, well, you've determined that there's a way for you to solve this for yourself, which is just fast forwarding. And, and we never need to know. Exactly. <laughs> well, for that person, we are beginning now. Set your timers. <laughs> so our two cases this week, the 2016 death of a nurse was originally believed to be a suicide. However, her paramedic boyfriend has just been convicted of her murder. And I have to tell you, some of the toughest cases that I've investigated are what we call these questionable, is it a suicide or is it murder? Those are the absolute hardest cases to prove. This one will prove that it was not that difficult, but generally they are. But first, a mother has reportedly confessed to running over her son with her car and then tossing his body into a river. The level of violence that is alleged in this case is revolting and overwhelming. It is a, a very disturbing case. It's got the country talking because how could a mother do this, allegedly, and it's on fire on social media. So it, let me give you a little bit and then you can jump in here. 29-year-old Brittany Gosney is accused of killing her six-year-old son, James Hutchinson. And when you see his picture that we're going to put up, he is the cutest little boy you've ever seen in your life. He's got reddish hair and freckles on his nose and the cutest smile and and the most stylish glasses. Oh, my God. He's the cutest ever. Every child is adorable. I love every child, but he is... My God, you could just see his spirit. So this took place in Middletown, Ohio, a town that is pretty small. It's 50,000 people, a little less than 50,000, and it's just north of Cincinnati. According to Fox 19's reporting and court records, Brittany drove to a wildlife area last Friday, February 26, and she tried to leave her son in the park. She apparently planned to just abandon him. He got out of the car. She closes the car, allegedly. This is according to all the police reports. And then she tries to drive away, and the little boy apparently tries to hold on to the car because he's scared because his mother is driving away. And in doing so, she allegedly confesses to the police that she ran him over. And that probably is what killed him. But police have not found the little boy. His body's not been found she allegedly confessed that she took the boy ultimately and, and dumped him in the Ohio River. But when I think of the last few minutes of his life, if this story is accurate, the way that the prosecutor says it happened, can you imagine the terror, that fear? Christy, I mean... I, I, there are just no words. Um, I mean, I'm a mother of three boys. And my youngest is about the same age as James. And so this one was a really tough one to even look at. Um, his just sweet little face showing up on camera. Everybody saying, like, from his school, like, that he was just so full of joy and such a lovely child. So it's just, it makes it that much more shocking to have this happen. Yeah. And what's incredible is that apparently this is what police believed happened, but a, it kind of all unraveled when the mother and her boyfriend went to the police station to write up the missing persons report. And the chief of police said their story wasn't making sense, meaning each of their versions wasn't matching. But nonetheless, the police said that they took this very seriously. They had a little boy who was missing. And so they, they put out the alerts. They put his photo up, a description of what he was wearing. It was on Twitter. It was on social media. So clearly the police took this very seriously because this little boy was indeed missing. Now, what's I also, you know, may get a little confusing here for everyone because the little boy is named James 
And then her boyfriend, Brittany's boyfriend, is also named James. So we'll try to keep that straight for all of you who are listening. Now, police say that Brittany described to them ultimately how she went back a half hour after allegedly running him over, went back to the park, found him in the parking lot, dead. Looked like he had a head injury. She allegedly told police that she scooped him up, put him in the car, drove him home, put him in bed. And then the next morning, she says to her boyfriend, okay, now we need to do something. And the two of them drive to the river, dump his body there, allegedly. The other kids, oh, that's the other thing. There are other children. When this happened, police say that her two other children were in the car. So there's speculation. Was her plan, if she had a plan, to get rid of all the children at once? Get rid of one? See how that works out and then go to for the other? I don't know. What What do you think, Lauren? You know, it's interesting because I read... It, it's interesting that the child that ultimately, very unfortunately has been killed, did share a name with the boyfriend. And I know that I've been reading speculation about her saying that her boyfriend was perhaps pressuring her into getting rid of the children, that he perhaps didn't want to be a stepfather to these children. It just feels very dark to me and very twisted that they share a name and that was the first one to go. Um, I did also read, and, and I, I don't know if this is true, but I did also read that she actually has another child who was already in foster care at that time, yeah. which again, and I, I wasn't able to find any other information about that or why that child was also in, in foster care, but it the, the picture that's being painted already is feeling very bleak. And I, I mean, it, it seems like, there was, I also read one story that said all three of them got out of the car, but then another story said it was just him that got out of the car. It's just feeling like there's no, obviously, there, there, there's no good intentions there. And it's, it's very sad to me, not only, like you say, what the last moments of this child's life were, but also these other poor children who now have experienced this. And I'm sure, you know, to what degree of what exactly happened and what exactly the truth was, it has to be just the biggest trauma. And that's truly just so sad, considering Child Protective Services obviously is aware of this family if, if another child has been removed um, you know, and put into foster care. I mean, I again, I'm speculating, but I do feel like that suggests that perhaps there has been things that have happened in the past also um, that maybe this wasn't the best home. So right. it's, it, it would not surprise me if she was, you know, in the mindset of wanting to perhaps get rid of all three. It's just so, so bizarre. The name connection to me feels like a real, there's something to that to me um, that's, that doesn't feel like a coincidence, you know? Yeah. So the boyfriend is 42-year-old James Hamilton. So just to make sure we, we've got his name clear out there. Uh, this apparently took place over three days. So... Apparently, it was last Friday that the mom allegedly took the children to the park and left little James there. Then, apparently, the following day, Saturday, is when she and her boyfriend, James, allegedly take the little James and toss his body into the Ohio River. And then Sunday morning, early in the morning, is when they go to the police now, when they go to the police, they tell them that James has been missing since the night before. So that's when their clock starts ticking in their story. They said to the police he was last seen wearing a shirt and a little pajama bottom with Batman on it, which makes me wonder, is that what he was wearing when he died? Is that... Was this his favorite outfit? I, I don't. Oh, it's so sad. So, so sad. Now, while police are investigating and getting the word out is when they start putting the pressure on Brittany and her boyfriend, James. And apparently, according to police, that's when Brittany breaks down and tells them and allegedly confesses. This confession, I believe, is going to be potentially problematic. And even though I'm not an attorney, this is why I think so. Because when she's finally taken to court, 
to set bond. She tells the judge that she has a learning disability and she doesn't understand what's going on. So, and then you're going to hear the police chief respond to that and say, look, she knew the difference between right and wrong. She knew exactly what was going on. She knew what her rights were. Of course, that's what the police are going to say. And believe me, I am not defending this mother if this is what she did. But she stands accused right now. But she stands accused because of her own admission. And we don't have James's body to tell us exactly how he how he died. What were the causes? We, we don't know any of that. So you put into play this other dynamic and it it really concerns me. It's, it's an interesting twist, I feel like, at, at this point um, for her to kind of come out with that admission. It, it was feeling to me, you know, we were, we, you know, many of us who are interested in, in this topic remember the Making a Murderer documentary on Netflix and, of course, the, the coerced confession um, that, that happened that we saw in, in that case. And I'm not suggesting that police were coercing her, but it felt to me in that moment, I agree with you when I saw that, I was like, that's such an interesting turn for this to take um, because, you know, what is the legality? How did that conversation go? How did it go from her and the boyfriend coming in to report this child missing within hours confessing. Do you know what I mean? Like that, that does feel to me like either, you know, either she is being honest and there, that, that is, that is something that, that she does live with, or she could be very cunning and she could be realizing that perhaps claiming to have a, a disability, claiming to have been coerced or something could help in her favor. I don't know. Do you think she was telling the truth, Chrissy? I mean, it's really tough to say. I just, I mean, it does seem like really, um, it just seems too perfect that it's like, well, I don't understand what's going on. And also, oh, it was his fault. So none of this is mine. But it just feels, uh, I mean, like the police said, learning disability or not, you still know harming a person is not correct. And you know that you're supposed to love a child. You're not supposed to do anything. I just still, I can't, my brain can't wrap around somebody being okay with harming a child in any way. Uh, the other two kids were only uh, seven and nine. So that's going to live with them for the rest of their lives. So I can't even imagine what they're going through, what they saw. So I have a really hard time feeling sorry for her in any way, but it, it could be a true thing about her, but it also just, to me, doesn't make up for what she's done. Oh, absolutely. It yeah. does. It, having a learning disability does not prevent you from being a truly loving and kind human being. Absolutely. Yeah. That Those emotions are still possible. So uh, let's let everybody judge for themselves, at least from this little part that we can hear from court. On Monday, Brittany was in court, and based on what we appear here, she seems confused, unclear about what's happening in the process. This clip is from Fox 19 TV. You like court appointed counsel, ma'am? I don't understand. You want to talk to a lawyer? Where's Officer Hoover? Well, he's not in right now. What about if the lawyer? I have a very disability, so I'm not understanding what you're saying. She seemed to be communicating fine. She understands right from wrong. She understood her constitutional rights. What I think will be interesting is when she allegedly confessed, did she have an attorney present? Because if she did not and she finally does get an attorney, the first thing that he or she is going to do is to have that confession tossed out. Yeah. And, and that to me, again, I, I mean, listen again, who, who's to say, but it feels odd to me that they went in that morning and they got a confession from her within hours in, I mean, if she does have a, a, a learning disability or, or what have you, perhaps she didn't realize that she should maybe be lawyering up, you know, that's not something that necessarily enters people's minds in general in those situations. So I agree with you. I do think that that is going to be potentially problematic down the road if, because it feels to me like the timing wise it just feels unlikely that she would have been able to get a lawyer present that quickly. And the other thing that the police chief said from his perspective, at no point in the process did he feel that she was showing any form of remorse. Chilling. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. You know, I have to say that this this case really had me reminded of that the Susan Smith case from 1994. Oh. Mm-hmm. That was the first thing that came back to me. Um, again, she she strapped her two young children into their car seats and and pushed their car into into a lake. Um, and 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 that whole how that all kind of fell out. And I, I was reading up about her a little bit last night and kind of. There was speculation at that time um, that she had a secret boyfriend who maybe didn't want children. And it was never it was never kind of clear to me how true or false that was. But it was an interesting connection because this this reminded me immediately of that case. And then to kind of see that there was that similar through line, because, again, I have I have read that there was from Brittany some speculation that that her boyfriend had pressured her into doing this. It's 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 such an interesting connection. Um, and it's, it's such a tragic kind of, uh, parallel, but the difference being in that case is that Susan Smith created a story about a carjacking and the children being taken that she stuck to for a certain amount of time, I think. And I, and I think that you're, you're kind of honing in on this as well. And I think what's interesting to me is that Brittany didn't create a story that lasted very long. First of all, the story between her and her boyfriend couldn't be kept straight to begin with. And then she was again, confessing within hours. It's questionable about whether or not there was a lawyer present. It just feels again, I I'm with you that my, my spidey sense is, is telling me that, that this is going to be, this is going to be a tough one um, down the road. So to prosecute, I feel like. And it's also interesting to note who is charged with what, because Brittany's been charged with murder, abuse of a corp and tampering with evidence. James, the boyfriend, has been charged with abuse of a corpse and tampering with evidence, not murder. So my guess is when things get a little tough, boyfriend James, if he has any information, is going to cooperate. And if he did not kill that child, he wants no part of it. And I think that's what's going to happen. I, I I just do. That, why, is, why is James going to stick up for her if he's not even charged with the murder? Again, both of them just charged, presumed innocent until they have their day in court. The case is indeed, obviously, very disturbing. And this tiny community is having a lot of trouble dealing with it and processing this information. I mean, if the rest of the country is struggling with it, can you imagine if this is your home? So they've been holding some candlelight vigils. And on the day that Brittany was in court, they had a candlelight vigil that night. So that would have been last Monday. James's father... Lewis Hutchinson was in attendance, and he told Cincinnati.com, quote, She killed my son. I don't even know how to process this. I want them both to rot. That's what I want. From his perspective, I can't even imagine what he's going through. I can't, I can't even imagine, right? I just also don't understand. Like, if you're in a case where, you know, you meet a boyfriend, he's very, I'm interested in you, but I just do not want any of your children why is your first thought, I'm just going to like abandon them in a parking lot in a wildlife area, as opposed to where, I mean, James clearly had a father in his life. Why couldn't she have just dropped him off on James, on Lewis's doorstep and been like, well, guess what? He's yours now. And then right. walked away and left him alone. Right. It's Other still th- right? a pain. It's still like not the nicest motherly thing to do, but it's, the kinder thing to do than just abandon him in the middle of nowhere. Well, yeah. not only was James's father there, but Brittany's sister, Heather Gosney, told the Cincinnati told Cincinnati.com that James obviously was a very sweet little boy and would light up a room whenever he walked in. She said that the last time she saw James alive was on a video call about a month ago. After that call, the sister says Brittany blocked her and the rest of the family. So they lost touch. And the sister believes that this new boyfriend, James, was behind that, trying to isolate her from the rest of the family. Heather also says they're having a very hard time in the family understanding the possibility here that her sister is charged with murder and she's charged with the murder of her nephew. So they can't wrap their heads around that one. That is a hard one to accept, especially if the details of the crime are as reported. They're extraordinary. I mean, that it's not like it was like a moment where the mother snapped. 
right? No, this appears to be calculated. Putting, loading the, the car up with the children, driving them to an area, putting the child outside the car, while you, I'm sure it could be argued that there wasn't an intent to murder him at that point, there was certainly an intent to get rid of the child at that point. Um, yeah, so to your point, I, I agree with you. This was definitely thought out. This was something that was not in the heat of the moment, again, which is still not excusing that, but it, it wasn't, um, there was time to cool down. There was time to think about it. There was the entire car ride. You know, what what was going through her mind at that point? And I think it's a really interesting detail that her sister is is saying that this boyfriend was potentially isolating her and whatnot, which, which can speak to this potential abusive relationship that, that obviously that is a telltale sign of, of at least early stages of, of emotional abuse, uh, mental abuse, trying to cut off uh, a partner from their support system, family, friends, and whatnot. But again, it, it just makes me think forward, um, like you've been saying, Anna, it makes me think forward to what is this court case going to look, look like? Because they can paint that, how much of, of a puppeteer are they going to try and make James um, Hamilton in this situation? What's the truth? You know, at the end of the day, he wasn't in the car, right? He At the end of the day, she was in the car. It's it's a you know it's a very sad thing and it, it's very sad that at no point um, it seems as though she changed her mind afterwards. The fact that she went back to the body is a very interesting point for this for me as well. That there was some there was some concern and whether the concern was that she would get caught or the concern was about the the child, you know obviously that's debatable. Um, but it's just interesting to me that she went back and then took him home and put him to bed. That that said, that would suggest to me that there were some feelings um, that maybe she was like, what have I done? But then I'm also perhaps giving her too much credit. Again, maybe she panicked. We can't leave the body out in the middle of nowhere. It'll be found. Um, it's just, it's, it's still also unthinkable that it hasn't been retrieved, that the body has not been found. And had they not confessed, no one at this point would have even known. Right, unless, remember, there were two children in the right. car who are potential witnesses here. So my guess is they know a lot. They oh, know a lot. Yeah, they'd have to, Also, you would think, though, at that age, they'd be terrified. Yeah. They just witnessed what happened to their little brother. I can't even imagine what those kids are feeling. So I could see them easily being like, you know what? We're not going to say a thing. We just want, just don't hurt us, hurt us in any way. But I mean, thankfully, they have been removed from the home. So yeah. that's... I guess the only bright light here, if there is one, there's not. I don't. So, Christy, do you think that Brittany's, Brittany had maybe some possible remorse and went back to get the child? Or do you think it was more of like, you know, maybe her friend James said, you know, you better go get the kid because you can't just leave him dead out there. They're going to find him and come after us. You know, my instinct, whether I'm right or not, I just feel like, is it possible? Like, I mean, from what I've heard, she put the kids in the parking lot, went to drive away. James grabbed onto the car hand, like a door handle, and she kind of dragged him for a while before he went under the car. Um, we assume that's what happened, but of course we don't know for sure. But I think that there's a part of her that was like her, her mother instinct kicked in and she was instantly like, oh, okay, is he okay? What happened? And then she went back to check on it and then finding him dead, I think maybe briefly she became like a mother in that moment of like seeing her child injured because her plan wasn't to injure him in the first place. Her plan was just to leave them there and walk away and just suddenly she's not a mom anymore, which is ridiculous because she had many other options she could have had. I know in these situations, a lot of uh, parents just feel like they have no other option. There's nothing else they can do. Whereas in this case, we know that James had a father that he could have gone to instead of being left somewhere. So it just feels like maybe in that brief moment, she turned around just to see. And then when he was found dead, it was, well, I guess we can't leave him here. Yeah. But at the same time, if you're going to spin the story of he went missing and suddenly he shows up in a rest area, like miles away from home, doesn't that just help your story? So maybe. it's weird that she would then take the body home so it's like, it almost feels like maybe there's a little remorse there, but she has shown nothing since then. And, and we don't know 
what the chances are of trying to recover James's body because this portion of the Ohio River moves fast and it's a treacherous area. So it's possible, we certainly hope so, for the sake of just the the dignity of giving James a proper funeral in addition to the forensics of what could have been the cause of death. And if there were any prior injuries which could be determined if there was prior child abuse, if he was ever harmed or there was other violence in the house. We don't know why the, so this would be the fourth child. We don't know why the fourth child was originally removed from the home. We, we don't know the details of that. I, I am very perplexed by this. I really am. I, I am. I find the confession to be potentially legally problematic I think her claims of having learning disability are going to further complicate things. And if police do not recover a body, so we know what the cause of death is and and for sure that he's dead, again, it's going to be another complication in this case. But I believe the boyfriend is the key to all this, the boyfriend and the other kids. That that, that is my guess. In the meantime, uh, the judge has set bond. For Brittany, it is $1 million. For her alleged accomplice, James Hamilton, the boyfriend, we've seen multiple reports from numerous news agencies setting the bond as high as 800000 and as low as 100000 And there are multiple sources, Cincinnati.com, USA Today. So because we can't narrow that number down, we're going to tell you that that's what's being reported now. Nonetheless, he would have to come up with the money to get out the preliminary hearing in this case, which is moving really quickly to get to a preliminary hearing, is scheduled for next week, March 8th. I think it's going to be fascinating to see what additional evidence the prosecutor presents. Yeah, I think that we're. this is just the beginning of a case that has the potential to be one of the ones that really rocks um, certainly the country, you know, I, obviously always the death of a child. I feel like those, those murder cases are horrific. Um, but I just feel like there's going to be twists and turns in this for a lot of the reasons we've already outlined. And I'm also very curious to see again, how much of a villain and, and mastermind they are going to try and make the boyfriend appear to be and how much he may or may not have actually been. I think mm-hmm. that that's going to be a huge, huge thing to come. Absolutely. I want to know how much they're going to try and pit each other against each other in Mm -hmm. all of this, where she's going to stand by like, oh, he's the one that made me do it. And he's going to come back with, I wasn't there at the time. She made me help her move his body. Right. So I'm interested to see which one of them is going to come out on that one. Yeah. My prediction is that he's going to flip against her and save himself. Yeah. For sure. Now on to our second story, where a Florida man has been convicted in the 2016 fatal shooting of his then-girlfriend. This is after police say he tried to stage her death as a suicide. 48-year-old Thomas Elmore Jr., who is a former paramedic, attempted to cover up the murder of his living girlfriend, 48-year-old Tamara Naish, making it look like she had actually killed herself inside the Riverview home. Now, Thomas told deputies that the former nurse, that's Tamara, had committed suicide. He said that she was despondent because she had recently lost her job, they were having money issues, and that's what happened. You know, and he he but there there's some stuff here that makes absolutely no sense. Now, he has been convicted of the murder. This is what just happened. So let's go back to September 22nd of 2016 when Tamara is found dead in her home cuz sometimes I love to do it in this chronology cuz it makes yeah. you sit there thinking like, if I were sitting here in the bathroom listening to this story with a guy, I'd be like, really? Okay, here come the really points. <laughs> her boyfriend Thomas said that he found her dead when he came home and he was so upset, ladies, so upset that he waited 24 hours before calling police. And he's a paramedic. Mm. The Tampa Bay Times reported that Thomas called the police finally at the urging of his attorney. So he'd called an attorney at this point, but he Mm. hadn't called the police. Very distraught. Mm. Very distraught. Who who has better medical 
advice than an attorney, <laughs> you know? When you are a paramedic and yeah. are trained to mm-hmm. save lives. And Goodness. you're around potential, you know, death, illness, injury, all of those things. I understand it could be different if it's a, someone who's close to you. But yeah, that did not hold any water for me whatsoever. And what do paramedics do? Oh, they race to the scene. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That they get called. That is their purpose in life is to help people and yeah. respond to situations like this. Okay, so clearly, if I'm police, I'm already incredibly suspicious with just this little bit of the story. He told investigators at the time that the day before that she was found dead, the two had been arguing over money because Tamara recently lost her job as a nurse, and that this argument, according to the Tampa Bay Times, took place at 1 a.m. after, after, I guess, Thomas got home from Hooters, because that's where I go when I'm upset. Yeah. I mean, they do have a good deal on wings. So if you're, <laughs> if you're not, if you're strapped for cash, I guess that's the place you go. But uh, it's just, I mean, I did read that they have, they did have uh, money issues because he had already dealt with a mortgage foreclosure mm. just a few months before this all happened. So, I mean, yeah, there was obviously money troubles, but like, isn't that always where cases like this start where something happens and it's like, oh, well, we were having money troubles and I put this on her for being causing the stress in this relationship. And right. I, I don't know. I, it doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, it's interesting. The, the Hooters detail is very interesting. I, I think that that. And that's, this isn't a judgment about people who go to Hooters, but in the context. Oh, yes, it is. No. <laughs> no, it is not. That was a joke, everyone. Please. Okay, it joke. was a freaking joke. It was a joke. Yeah. Um, but in the context of this run out, you know, in the context of someone who lied and staged this murder to look like a suicide, it is an interesting detail that it does seem that there was huge tension between the two of them. It does seem like that is true. It does seem, Christy's bringing up this mortgage foreclosure. It does seem like stress is high. It says to me, he's blowing off steam if he's going to Hooters. If you're going to Hooters or you're going to a strip club, to me, that suggests you're blowing off steam or you're 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 doing something for you. Um, coming home to a fight, okay, I could see perhaps the Hooters of it all could have been a part of the fight. Um, potentially, again, some women would be fine with that. Some women wouldn't be. So it it just it just again it adds I, to me it just adds another color in in this kind of when we're painting this picture that detail the color of course being the orange shorts but um, of the Hooters waitresses but but you know and what the I mean? tank like, tops don't the they, tank tops match of course of no, course I, they do but oh, you know matchy what I mean? matchy like, that's you too <laughs> it is it is um, but you know what I mean like it, to me that detail is just very it's a very interesting kind of of moment in this, in this chronology, like you're saying is, is that Hooters, he had been going to Hooters. It feels like his stress level was, was potentially high. I don't know. It, it, to me, that detail just stood out as being very interesting, um, in his, what his mental state was at this time. And so it continues. So he comes home, they get into this argument and then he tells police that Tamara kicked his dog. He grabbed the dog and then he went to his parents' house. He was really mad. And then when he came back, finally, is when he found her dead. And then apparently there's another 24 hours that we're waiting before he calls for help. Now, Thomas says that he found his girlfriend already dead on the bathroom floor. And Thomas said, this is what I find interesting, because how would I ever know that someone clearly killed themselves Like I would, if I found someone dead, my girlfriend, my significant other, and there are gunshots, I mean, I, oh, okay, it's possible because she was holding the gun, I might, but it wouldn't be my place to tell the police that she killed herself. Like I would be asking the police for help, to help me. I, I, that's, for me, just, I know that's really minor in this whole thing. I know Christy's dying to get to the details of the body and and, <laughs> and that. So go go for it. Yeah. Explain why his story didn't add up. Um, I mean, well, there is the fact that her, um, there were two bullet wounds in her body, one being in her head or face, I don't know specifically which one, and one being in her hand. 
And they're suggesting that maybe she had held her hand up to, you know, protect herself instinctively. And she was shot that way. And that is not how one commits suicide, I don't believe. I mean, it just... It would mean that she would have to shoot herself through her hand to get here. And what about which hand the gun was found in? That's right. Her gun, the gun was found in her left hand, but she's actually right-handed, which is also a detail you think he would know being, you know, her significant other. And he might've noticed that, but I still find it fascinating to think that he's, he wants us to believe that he sees a woman that he's been with. They were together, what, like three, four years. And that he sees her dead, bloody on the floor. And his reaction is, Oh, this is upsetting. I'm going to go lie down. And then a day from now, I'll call the police. But my attorney first. Yes. I would be running in that room. I would be screaming. I would have blood all over me because I would be like doing things you're not. I would be holding my partner being like, are you okay? What's going on? Breathe. Check for that. But it seems like he just walked in and went, "Ooh, that's a mess I will deal with tomorrow. And then called the next day. Yeah, it it the story I agree with and I think Anna too you you may have been kind of hinting this too. I feel like it's it was odd that that was the story that he went with. Go with the story of an intruder. You know like like there was a masked man or 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 something, you know, in trying to cover up this his own involvement because yeah, like the, the the bullet hole through the hand to me is like it's such a giveaway. The gun being in the wrong hand, this is this is requiring that's just not how people kill themselves and and you would think again having experience as an emt these just feel like big details you know that that for him to miss for him to to kind of concoct this story he also had a full 24 hours to think about it and and to me it's interesting that 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 was kind of the best that he came up with again to me the story is i came home like you're saying and i came home i found her dead i don't know what happened what happened? She's dead. She's been shot. Oh my God, someone must have broken in. You know, like that to me feels like, not that I'm suggesting this is how to cover up a a murder, but it feels like there are options that were better than the story that he kind of wove. And that ultimately, of course, that was his undoing, which again, is, is, is just, it's so sad. It's so sad too, you know, that, that what, what her, what her last moments must have been as well. And then, and then being left there for a full 24 hours, is just so, it's so dark. It's so, uh, it's so sad. It's so sad for that poor woman who was a nurse who had devoted her life into, you know, helping others into, into be dealing with, with the sick and the the injured and all of that. It's, it's really, it's really a tragedy that, that um, that's, was her unfortunate demise. Well, they believe that she was likely there more like 36 hours. So uh, the time frame probably goes back somewhat to that whole time where he claims he left the house, went to Hooters and all, all of that. And apparently the body appeared to have been somewhat handled or manipulated. So it's possible in this 24-hour period, mind you, he's already been convicted by a jury, hasn't been sentenced yet, that he could have been cleaning up after himself, cleaning up the scene and setting her up and thinking, okay, maybe a suicide is going to look more like a a possibility of of what happened here. I do find it interesting that the family said, her family, when they were contacted by the authorities to tell them that she had passed, they said they were never told by the authorities that there was any possible investigation into a suicide. All they said was, this is an investigation, but they never used the words suicide. So my guess is from the very moment they walked in there, the cops were very, very suspicious. Uh, at, at least, you know, you've got some justice now because he's been convicted and he did not get away with this staging. The um, This is according now to the Hillsborough State Attorney General, Andrew Warren. He said the medical examiner ruled it was physically impossible for her to have shot herself based on the available evidence. And the jury agreed that there was just no way that she could have done this with her non-dominant hand. I don't know what happened, but I think what most likely happened is they got into an argument. It became heated. He shot her that she's probably defending herself as she sees the gun being raised. My guess is that's what happened. 
And yeah. it probably was over money. And it probably was yeah. a stressful situation. Yeah. And he also probably wanted it to look like a suicide because he has previous um, domestic violence in his past from, I believe, both were against his first ex-wife, but he also has a second ex-wife, according to all of his court records that I've looked through, which were legal to look mm-hmm. through because it's open <laughs> for the public. Um, but yeah, if he's already been charged with different domestic violence cases, uh, he knows that a cop is going to come in, look at this scene and be like, oh, well, we know you've done this. So he tries to make it look like it wasn't him, but did a really bad job in doing so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The Tampa Bay Times were reported that Thomas was arrested twice in 1998 on domestic violence charges, which also included a violation of a restraining order. And then in 2012, he was arrested on a charge of driving while under the influence. The jury deliberated for eight hours and found him guilty of second degree murder. Thomas has yet to be sentenced, but that will be happening soon. You know, I was wondering, too, if he'd been if he'd been out at Hooters for the night, potentially, if if the timeline is shifting, like you're saying, if it was actually 36 hours, like where does that line up? Was he drunk at the time? Did he come home? Had he been out drinking? He's drunk. He's gotten angry. He's gotten the gun out to threaten her, you know, in the moment. Again, if he's got a history of domestic violence, especially, I feel like intimidation and bullying, all those kinds of things are not uncommon. Um, And then in the heat of the moment, you know, goes for it. Uh, I feel like that's probably sometimes the the simplest explanation is true. And that that feels like it absolutely could have been the way that things had gone. And again, if he has also has a history of a, of a DUI, then that also suggests to me, I it wouldn't shock me if he had been, you know, drinking or drinking and driving and, and those kinds of things in this situation as well. It's, it's again, it's it's so sad. And, and you know, I, I mean, obviously domestic violence as well, it's, it is, is such a huge prevalent thing in, in, in everywhere in the world, but certainly in this country as well. And it just goes to show too that, you know, three or four years into a relationship, you think that you probably know somebody. And even if you feel like you're in this, you know, for, for some people, I'm sure this toxic relationship or, or an arguing or, or what have you relationship, um, you know, did she ever think that it would escalate to this? I mean, probably not. You know, who knows how much she knew about his past? Did she know about those past charges? Did she know about what happened with his ex-wives? Or did he spin a different story for her that she believed? You know, I think what I'm getting at is, is, you know, I would encourage anyone to run background checks on potential mates. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> because yeah. honestly, honestly, though, all jokes aside, we live in a society where we, a lot of people are partnering up now with people that you meet on the internet or on apps, which no no judgment or shade. I've done my fair share of, of dating sites and apps in my time. Um, but I, I feel like, again, it's like you just really don't know. And I think that it is, you know, people joke about, you know, well, don't be crazy. Don't stalk them. Don't, you know, whatever. And I'm, I would say running stalk a background them. check here or there, not, yeah. not always the worst idea. Yeah, yeah. It, but you know what? When someone is in a relationship like that, it's very hard to get them out. I, 100%. I've got two very well-educated girlfriends who fell for total scammers, total scammers. And no matter what I would say, no matter what I would dig up, no matter what logic I tried to apply, there was no way that I could reach them. And ultimately, until they found their way out of that relationship, could they finally step back and say, oh, my God, what a dummy. I feel so taken advantage of. Uh, yeah, 100%. And it can happen to anyone. And I think that that's, the, that's a really important thing, too, is that, you know, anyone can find themselves in one of those situations, one of those relationships. And you're right. And when you get in it, it becomes extremely difficult to get out of. It's it's not that simple um, at all. And I hope that by talking about these stories, it just, you know, raises, raises the awareness again and, and makes people realize that, you know, being, having a discerning eye and, and, you know, being suspicious of people is not, always the worst. I think that sometimes that is vilified in people, certainly now. And I think, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of people out there who want to take advantage of people. And there's a lot of people out there also who are, who don't have great intentions. And I think protecting you as number one is, is always the most important thing. And keeping these stories going again, spreading the word, getting it out there so that other people can hear them and go, oh man, this person that I'm dating, I've been having some of these thoughts about, you know, Always protect yourself first, I guess is my point. Trying, I'm trying to make this a cautionary tale. But it really, it really, it did strike me, you know, hearing the details of this and being three or four years in. I think that you, your brain doesn't, 
or for me, my own perceptions, I don't think about things in those in those ways. Sometimes when you hear about cases like this, it's people that they didn't know for very long. But this is someone she knew really well. And mm-hmm. I'm sure did never never thought that that would would treat her that way, or I'm sure never thought that she was in danger in that way. So it's it's just such a it's such a tragedy for for her certainly and her family. I mean, you also don't know um, how much of himself he was actually showing her. Great point. Because I mean, I am blanking on what his name is, but that uh, that police officer a month or so ago who it came out that he had multiple girlfriends in multiple different states and he was married and had children and they had no idea any of this was going on. So it's insane to me how much somebody can hide from the person that they're the most intimate with. And I think what I'm speaking to really is my own fears. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) That's exactly it. You know, though, it's, it's so true. Like there's so many things that people can hide from you and that's just, it's so terrifying to think about. Yeah, it is. It really is. Okay, ladies, time to move on. It is now time for our comments section. And since so many of you wrote on YouTube last week that you were so excited and happy to have Owen Michael back. Owen, by the way, launched this podcast 101 episodes ago (laughs) that uh, we thought, Owen, you should always come back and do the comments section. He runs the website and all the other stuff for true crime. So what have you got today in the comments section? Hello, 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 ladies. Um, Anna, I'd like to talk later, if we could, about maybe um, matching tops going forward. <laughs> With respect to Lauren and Christy, I'd like to think kind of about maybe, it. Uh, poach it would be that very idea. Cute. It's a good um, yeah. choice to make, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we can uh, <laughs> do some interesting things there. Um, yes, we do get comments on uh, on our various uh, social media platforms. Um, you may have heard about this story. Uh, Lady Gaga's dog walker was uh, shot in Hollywood last week, and two of her dogs were stolen, um, unfortunately. But the dog walker is now recovering uh, in the hospital. He's um, uh, well enough. He's been doing an Instagram post and giving his account of how the whole thing went down. If you haven't heard about that story, it's uh, uh, basically Lady Gaga was out of town. I believe she was in Rome doing some work, as she does. And her dog walker in Hollywood was walking three French bulldogs. And apparently somebody drove up, two people drove up, tried to basically fought with this uh, this dog walker. His name is Ryan Fisher. Uh, and they ended up shooting him twice in the chest. And they took two of the dogs. Uh, the third dog did not uh, get taken. Apparently, uh, the dog comforted Fisher while he was bleeding on the ground before paramedics arrived. Uh, like I said, he is safe. Uh, the third dog, Miss Asia, was safely recovered. Now we have uh, the other two French Bulldogs, uh, Koji and Gustav, have been returned. Um, Lady Gaga did offer a $500,000 reward for the return of the dogs. Uh, No questions asked. Uh, LAPD did say that uh, a woman dropped off the dogs last Friday night, uh, but she's not considered a suspect, and it's kind of unclear if there's uh, any... uh, if there's any reward going out or not. Um, however, this is a story still developing. Lindsay G says, people are crazy shooting someone to steal two dogs. Sure, I know Frenchies are worth a pretty penny, but still, uh, apparently that's true. Uh, the French Bulldogs are um, yeah. a very coveted dog these days. Uh, not as, not as uh, for my taste, I'd rather have a, a rescue Chihuahua. So if we're... <laughs> On, on Lucky for here. you, we have a few in, in uh, several of these homes. A couple <laughs> of these people. That's right. Uh, Donna L says, this is a thing. People steal pets and sell them in other towns. Sadly, it's a quick buck. Uh, it does seem to be a, a, a thing that recurs once in a while in uh, Los Angeles. Every couple to- a couple times every year, we hear about um, sort of high, high-end high dog napping, um, which, leads, which leads us to Teresa A, who says, I wonder if they were new. I wonder if they knew they were her dogs, which is interesting whether these people targeted, um, whether they knew this was a celebrity owned a dog or whether they were just after French Bulldogs. But uh, uh, again, thankfully, Brian Fisher is recovering. He uh, looks like he's going to survive. Um, he's conscious. Uh, we will give you updates on that story. Well, you know, Owen, there are any. Uh, what's interesting about this is that 
there was, you know, people, obviously, the, the animal people, they're, everyone's like losing their minds. Are the dogs okay? But the there people. were a lot of comments that were critical of Lady Gaga for offering the reward for the dogs, no questions asked, as if that were suggesting that we don't need to find the assailants, meaning wait a minute, what do you mean no questions asked? 500000 for the dogs? What about the poor man in the hospital? There was a lot of criticism uh, on, in social, on social media about that. I, I, don't, I, I don't know what I think about this case, ladies. Well, my question is, what's the legality there? Because she can say no questions asked, but can the police not now pursue this woman as a potential connection I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm, right. I'm curious I, about that. I, I, you know, this is a, I'm not exactly clear on this myself either, but I think that she's certainly allowed to, you know, uh, say to the public, I'm willing to give a $500,000 away for this. Uh, I'm sure the LAPD probably, um, uh, you know, probably behind the scenes said, you know, there's going to be some questions asked. Yeah. This is also obviously, um, that was her response the day after it happened. So I think, there was a lot of heat, heat of the moment type of stuff going on where people were reacting like, yes, there was a man who was almost died um, walking the dogs. I can see, I suppose, how they might think that was insensitive about the thing. But I think she just really wanted to you know, get the dogs back. And she was obviously she's going to cover medical bills and that kind of thing for um, the dog walker. But, um, yeah, some of the stuff seems to be sort of on the fly uh, uh, reaction. And uh, I'm sure that we will hear more about this. I don't I'm I'm definitely fascinated to find out how this uh, strange woman showed yes. up at the police station and said, hey, I found these dogs walking on the street or whatever. I mean, they, and I know I'm nothing. Sure there's going to be nothing. Yeah. There, like, how does sure this happen? Further. How do you just find two very expensive Frenchies that, you know, the entire world knows have been dog napped? This is very suspicious. She may very well have nothing to do with it, but there has to be. How is that possible, right? Like, how did that happen in order to accomplish that? I don't know. I Wild conjecture. Maybe she knows the dog nappers themselves and managed to talk. Who knows? I, I mean, I'm sure that um, the high profile situation will get some updates on it as well. But uh, yeah, to tune in uh, for more. We'll definitely have uh, more comments to come uh, on the future on this. Um, for our second case, a woman in Tulsa was arrested in a burglary investigation after allegedly breaking into a house occupied by a woman and her two children, uh, two young kids, uh, and the suspect left incriminating evidence behind and uh, on her person, allegedly, of course. Uh, someone had knocked out a screen while the family was home and uh, came through the window, but apparently realizing the house was occupied, the suspect fled. A bag of Cheetos and a water bottle were left at the scene. As I said, a bag of Cheetos was left at the scene by the suspect, by the master thief. Uh, Tulsa police officers detained Sharon Carr in the area, and the victim reportedly identified her as the suspect. The police report said that Carr was further linked to the crime by Cheeto residue on her teeth. There but for the grace. Uh, WW says Chester Cheetah may have been on the case. Indeed. Uh, let me see. Suspicious character. Pamela C. says, that's how I would get caught. Uh, Kit Kat wrappers would do me in. <laughs> snack food. Don't, don't commit crimes with snack food. Uh, Jimmy A. could not resist the crunch. Uh, yeah, could be. Um, I saw another, uh, uh, another comment. This could be a viral uh, marketing campaign. Uh, oh, I doubt really? it, but you never know. <laughs> that, you know. Maybe some smart people over at Cheetos, Cheetos is oh are, uh, are, are going to... You use this as an opportunity. Stay tuned. Well, I've got to ask Chrissy because she's a mom of kids, right? She's got several uh, small kids. Okay, so when you see the Cheetos residue on the teeth and you're being told, no, mom, I did not get into the cupboard, what does Christy mom say? Oh, I mean, my kids would be not just in the teeth. It would be Cheeto fingerprints on the cupboards and just all along the wall and on the towel from wiping their faces off. I mean, that right away is, you know what's happening. Um, it tells its own story. My big question here is, so she brought snacks to, to break into somebody's house? Or she but, stole the snacks. 
Uh, I get the idea that it was a, um, <laughs> that she's just, you know, as one does, uh, you know, you carrying around a, a snack and a bottle of water and a crime of opportunity presents itself. Uh, or, you know, she was uh, expecting it to be an empty house, thought she'd be there for a little while, uh, take her time, enjoy a, enjoy a, a, a a snack, a snack and a beverage while she's doing this. Um, it's tough to say. I don't know that we're going to get a lot of uh, updates from the Tulsa police <laughs> on this one, but uh, sure. I will strive to uh, gather that news as it happens. Uh, I, just, I just like the idea of someone walking around with the Cheetos and a bottle of water and being like, you know what this needs? Some Netflix. I wonder if where's a house? Where's a TV? I don't have a TV. So she went to the nearest TV she could find to just like sit and binge the crown or whatever it was i just yes. like it who mm -hmm. i who brings the snacks and i, then, like I mean kudos to her for being like oh there's people here i didn't know and then yeah. leaving at, right. like, at least she didn't uh you know it wasn't like a bag of peanuts or something like that where uh, you know crucial evidence would not be have, would not have been so um obvious with, uh, uh, wouldn't stick orange, to the tea. Uh, yeah, sure. exactly. Look at you. Mm. Yeah. yeah, but she'd you. smell like peanut butter, and then it would be more of a scent thing than a. Your Honor, that's circumstantial. Thing. That's circumstantial. <laughs> uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not gonna. Uh, Fair. Uh, you know. Uh. We'll see. I just feel like Cheetos, the, the terminology is dust. Like we all know the term Cheetos dust. And, mm -hmm. and I think of dusting for fingerprints. And I think about like, I don't know that I would have been eating something that I could so easily, you know, I know it was found in her teeth, but I, I feel like I personally, sure. not that I'm a criminal, um, but I, I maybe wouldn't have been putting something on my hands and then touching a, a window to commit a crime that would leave a very, you know, orange print of my finger. This would be uh I can't say for sure, but I would I would bet that this would probably be the first forensics, uh, the first time a forensics investigator would uh, have some of their work done for them by Cheeto dust. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Owen, thank you as always. Such a pleasure. Thank Truly. you. Thank you. Thank you. See you next week. See you next week. Well, that is our program for this week. Lauren and Christy, it's been such a pleasure to have you on. Where can people find you on social media? Where can they find your podcast? Tell us everything. <laughs> yeah, the podcast is True Crime and Cocktails. You can find us uh, on our website, www.truecrimeandcocktails.com. That's got links to everywhere you can listen to us, all the different places. We're basically streamable anywhere. Podcasts are streamable. You can find us on YouTube, all of the above. And you can find us on social media, Instagram at True Crime and Cocktails, Facebook at True Crime and Cocktails, and on Twitter at Not Detectives. Those are <laughs> at Not Detectives. I love that. <laughs> now, I noticed on your Instagram that you have some great pieces of um, either animation, cartoons, artwork, a variation that's done by your fans. I love that. It's the craziest thing in the world to me. I mean, again, I am a stay-at-home mom. And so like six months ago, five months ago even, um, nobody really knew who I was. And now all of a sudden we're getting fans who are so insanely talented drawing all these pictures. One made a video. They're just sending all of this stuff in. And I just appreciate that they're drawing me thin. <laughs> I said that to my husband last night. I was like, Ooh, they keep drawing me very skinny and I'm here for that. Uh, but it's just so impressive and I love it so much. It's It just all happened out of nowhere and people are just really getting on board and we could not appreciate that more. Oh, it's wonderful. It's been a pleasure to have you on because I love the perspective, you know, of the crime fan. We, we, I always call this the extended crime family, and everyone's got some role and some point of view that always makes the discussion really interesting. And Christy, I love the fact that you just love to dig for information. And what I like about our podcast is how interactive it is, especially on YouTube with the comments, because people yeah. will share what they think, their theories. And I always love hearing that because sometimes I'll miss something or I'll be like, oh, I hadn't considered that. And I love uh, that interactive nature of it. Oh, yeah, we definitely like that is our I think that's been our thing from day one. We just want to build a community of, you know, like-minded people, safe space, you come in, you say what you want about a case and we will, we take their comments and their thoughts and we've done fan theory episodes where we talk about them, but it's just great to have like just a community where everyone can come together and we all like the same thing. And it's, it's just, everyone's so supportive of everybody else. It's just been a really beautiful thing. 
Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Also, I did notice um, on your personal Instagrams that, Lauren, you have rescued chihuahuas. I do. Or at least one rescue chihuahua. Yes. I have two. Two, actually. Two. Yeah. Okay. I have a rescue chihuahua, Miss Jackio, who today at least is sleeping upstairs. A few weeks ago, she was barking during the episode. And then, Christy, you have yeah. snoring cats. Yes. I mean, I have two cats. One is very well known for snoring. <laughs> We've decided she's kind of like bagpipes, where she's just, you, you, she's very, a very loose cat, and you pick her up and she makes the weirdest noises. So we're like, okay, she's our little, uh, she's our little set of bagpipes. But uh, what would I, you do without animals, you know? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. And I'm always, you know, worried when I meet someone who doesn't like animals. It's like not liking children. Right. Like specifically not liking them. It's like, ah, if you don't have an opinion, that's fine. But specifically yeah. not liking is like, ooh, I'm suspicious. Yeah. That's and a, I have extended that yeah. now as a as a mother of, of of chihuahuas specifically. People who chihuahuas get a bad rap. Oh you God, know, they people, do. People think that they're yappy and bitey and all of the above. Well, they are. And they and they are. Yes. But they're also the most loving, loyal, amazing, smart, hilarious dogs. I think, you know, people's perception of them, especially when people have met uh, my dogs, often changes. They're like, wow, I didn't realize that chihuahuas could be so affectionate and that they're so cute and funny. And I, I that for me is, you know, my, my plea to people always is just keep an open mind. Keep an open mind, you know. Um, you know I agree. Uh, uh, there's problems in every breed, you know, there's always yes. going to be some individual, um, some individual, <laughs> uh, jerks, but they're not all that way. Um, I know what I, I love about great. Jackie O cause she's a rescue from the Van Nuys animal shelter. She was a featured pet in the front. Nobody <gasps> wanted her. She was in the cage and she looked terrible. And like, you're trying to figure out like, why didn't anybody want her when she's there in the very front and she'd been available then I figured it out when a bunch of kids ran by and she's in her cage and she's like, I will kill you. <laughs> and, and I was like, wow, is she really like that? And then when they took her out, I saw she was so sweet and docile. Maybe she, you know, I figured maybe the running around was too much. I'm like, I'm not going to run around. And she's funny that way. She is as the most affectionate dog I've ever had. I love her to pieces. I say she rescued me. But I got to tell you, when she's out there and she sees like the neighbor dog, like she she is like, I'll kill you. I'll kill you. And if a bird flies by the house, she gets very upset. I'll kill you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm a, one of mine peaches. She's four, four and a half pounds. And uh, she will try and take on any other size dog we may see in the neighborhood. And she gets her entire back mohawk. Yes. The fur like yes. goes up and it is truly hysterical. And I just always say, I'm like, well, she's, she's doing her best to protect me. She's doing what she thinks is right. <laughs> right. She's a tough girl. I just say she she's is. a tough girl from Van Nuys. Yeah. Exactly. And if you're from exactly. LA, you know what that means. hundred percent. hundred percent. Well, ladies, thank you so much. You can find me and uh, Tales of Jackie O at Anna G News, Anna with one N. Um, as always, you can find our content on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, and of course, on YouTube, Get updates by subscribing to our newsletter, which Owen works very hard on. Just go to truecrimedaily.com. Until next week, this is True Crime Daily, the podcast. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. And as we always say, don't do crime. <laughs>